Welcome to another episode of Likeable Science here on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Ethan Allen. Uh, with me today is Dr. Michael uh, Kiar, uh, an assistant professor in the Department of Tropical Plant and Soil Sciences at UH Manoa. Welcome, Michael. Mm, thank Mikey, you. Thank you for say. having me. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, Likeable Science is all about the impacts that science has on people's lives and why people should care about science. And I think what you do is just really fits, that, fits the theme amazingly well. So, in short, why don't you just give a, a quick elevator speech of what it is you do here. Sure. Um, so I work with plants and their genomes, and we try and figure out how uh, we can make plants uh, that are going to feed us, going to be more healthy, going to be more ecologically friendly, and how we can do it on uh, fairly rapid times, time scales, and how can we can do it, do it with uh, climate changing and with new pests and diseases popping up all the time. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> It's important. <laughs> this is critical stuff, you know, as, as we mm -hmm. uh, face a lot of challenges, including mm -hmm. growing populations and shrinking mm -hmm. amounts of farmland. It's, it's more important than ever to, to do this. But let's start, out, let's, let's unpack that a little bit, uh, be sure our audience understands. You, you use the term genomics there. Right. So genomics has something to do with the genes, right? Exactly, exactly. So we, we all have heard about genes. We remember from uh, high school biology. Um, they, they are what uh, give us various characteristics, like eye color, hair color, this thing, uh, th these, these types of things. We're talking about plants, seed color, leaf color, things like that. But um, when we talk about gene, uh, genomics, we're talking about the entire genome. So every single gene that, uh, pr that's present in an organism. And what we're also talking about is where they're located, what physical structures are there, what's, what's next to them, how far are they away from other genes, are genes sometimes inherited together, that sort of thing. Right. And plants are particularly complex, right, because plants have huge genomes. We have, what, 22,000 genes, roughly. Plants right. have well, 200,000? Well, so plants, it depends on the plant. They can, be, yeah. they can have massive genomes. So humans, if we go just on regular genome size, um, humans have a genome of about, you know, maybe 3 billion base pairs. Well, wheat has a genome of 16 billion base pairs. Wow. You know, you're talking about something five times, uh, more than five times the size of uh, the human genome. And, and, and when you're talking about genes, you're talking about that same thing, five times the, no the number of genes and that, and that sort of thing. Right, so this makes it more complex because you've got to essentially read through all that, all those it's, 16 billion it, it, pairs, it, it, that, in, in that, essence. That's, that's exactly, tr that's, that's very true. You have a lot of weird things going on, genomes that are duplicated, so that in essence, um, instead of ha uh, in humans where you have one co copy, copy of the genes from your mother, one copy from your father. In plants, you can have four copies or five copies, or four, four copies, six copies, even eight copies of these genes, um, which makes it a little bit more complicated in when you're trying to expect what that, in, what, um, that inheritance pattern is going to be. But we have some things that make it a lot easier, too. You know, we can do controlled, uh, controlled mating in plants. Mm -hmm. And also plants, uh, a lot of plants, not all, but many plants uh, can be their own mother and father. Right. They can self-pollinate. So that, that what that leads us to do is we can get we can get a really good idea of what the expectation is for what inheritance is going to be. And the other thing that that lets us do is we can we can completely a hundred percent inbreed an individual. So what what that means is instead of having two copies or four copies or eight copies, right? you essentially have one form of that gene that's the same, right. Right. Which, which really makes it easier when you're trying to do an analysis. Right, and plus then that plant will always produce plants that are exactly. essentially clones of itself. Exactly, right? yeah, yeah. 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 So if, if you've gotten good characteristics and it weathers well and has a good strong root system and puts yep. out great fruit, that's exactly yeah, all of its offspring will have those same characteristics. And, and that's, that's exactly right. And, and it, it'll, it'll do that without any special uh, manipulation, like uh, man, many people at home have probably um, cloned a plant before, you know, and by cloning a plant, that's just, you know, maybe cutting out an eye of a potato right. and then regenerating a whole plant from that. Right. That's a, that you've, you've cloned that right. potato or maybe a sweet right. potato where you've cut um, a piece of that stem and then started growing it at your house. Again, that's cloning that potato, right. it's, it, which in this case is regenerating a whole plant from a cell without, um, w without any sexual reproduction right. taking place. Right. But now, particularly in this day and age, when we have climate change, we have mm -hmm. soils getting polluted, salinated, we have, as you say, pests moving into areas that they didn't before, 
there's more need to sort of, you can't just rely on one cultivar, one line of you your plate, right? you because it may be vulnerable to something new. It, it, exactly. A lot, of the, a lot of the changes we made in the food system uh, in the last 80 years have been to really homogenize it, and that's had some benefits in terms of we've greatly increased food production, but now we're dealing with some of these unintended negative consequences of uh, that real narrow, uh, really limited diversity that's, that, that can potentially be more susceptible to, to, to pests and diseases. And we're trying to figure out ways, how can we, how can we maintain this high level, these high levels of productivity Without um, uh, without having this increased risk, and that's where genomics can come in, right? Because right. because what you can do is now very precisely you can you know this part of the genome is related to what makes the food taste so good. This part of the genome is related to disease resistance, and may and maybe uh, and, and you can combine them very precisely because you have. Um, uh, what we call genetic markers. You can imagine those simply as street signs in a city. Mm -hmm. And what you can do is, you know, the, the, the idea of, um, or it doesn't, it can be street signs in a city or it can be different towns on a map, right? So, so for example, you can say, well, I really like this street in Kailua. I want that street to be next to, um, right next to UH Manoa, right? Mm -hmm. We can't do that in, in geography. <laughs> we can do that with genomics because when we know where they are, we can move them. Right, you can, you can literally yeah. cut things out Stick them yes, back and, and well, and, and we can use the mechanisms of plants to do that. So that's what happens during sexual reproduction. Right. Parts of the genome get reshuffled when you have when you use different parents. It's right. it's a, a different combination, and you can just look for combinations now that uh, have the beneficial uh, the the beneficial structure that you like. Right. Which is and again in plants, this is something we can do because from a single from a single cross you can get hundreds and hundreds of seeds. Mm -hmm. And because we have this ability to self-pollinate, and, and which are clones, you can actually generate thousands and thousands of offspring from the exact same two parents. Huh. OK, great, great. And so you use the term domesticating plants. Right. So I know plants, of course, have evolved over time. Right. And we have certainly had a hand in that, right? Most, we most certainly have. And just as we domesticated wolves into mm -hmm. dogs, as it were. We've yeah. domesticated these wild... That's exactly... Th that, the exact same process has uh, taken place. And actually, all of our food plants come from all over the world. Um, so if, if you could show us our first slide here. Th this map is... Uh, that our, um, That's oh, not the right one. Oh, the, um, actually, the slide... Uh, the, the map of where the food plants come from. Uh, yes, yeah, so what you're seeing here is we're seeing 64 of the most grown plants all over the world. And what you're seeing with our little cartoons here is where these plants came from. So if we're looking at North America here, blueberries, strawberries, sunflower, huh. right? But then if we're looking at, um, if, if we're looking at, at, uh, at East Asia, we're seeing a completely different set of plants in terms of um, where we're seeing citrus, we're seeing rice, we're seeing all uh, completely different sorts of plants and independently all across the world mm -hmm. we've domesticated plants and now what we can do is we've moved them around just right. as we've moved around the world as people and now we have these complex palettes that we really really like from all these different places yeah and and so what we can do now is because we know how this process has occurred we can take these favorable characteristics and say oh we want this this plant that looked like this to to uh, to be um, to now uh, we can modify a related plant or 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 a wild relative to do that. Right, and I mean for generations people have crossbred plants for desirable characteristics. Oh. But what you're doing now is much it's a much more precise, sophisticated, and more rapid way of doing that. Right, that, that, that's exactly right. So people for tens of you know for more than ten thousand years people have been been doing been doing this. You cross plants, you you look at all of their offspring, and then you save the seed from the best one. What plant breeding does is we try and systematize this. So we know based, uh, uh, based on genetics, right, the idea of what we expect our ratios, our segregation ratios to be. Um, uh, we, we, and so what we can do is we can say, we'll need to grow this many plants to find the one that we like. Uh -huh. and, that's gonna, and, then, and then what that lets us do is instead of just um, looking in the field for this one looks really, really good. What we can do is we can 
say, well, we need this plant to, um, we need this plant to be resistant to this disease. The genetic inheritance is controlled by two genes. How many plants are we going to need to grow to, to make sure we have resistance? Well, is that disease resistance gene uh, close to, or in genetics we call that linked, mm -hmm. is it linked to another gene that um, will have a negative effect on, say, flavor? Mm -hmm. Well, then we need to do, how, how big of a population will we need to grow then to find an individual who has our disease resistance but not the gene for bad flavor. Yeah. And, and we can figure that out. Mm -hmm. And then we know how many we have to look for. And then because we have the genetic markers, we have our street signs. Mm -hmm. we, can, we can say, um, well, we want, we want uh, King Street uh, you know, to be next to Waikiki. Mm -hmm. um, or, you know, and so we, we can do that and find the individual who has that unique combination. Right. And these days, I would think with some of the new technologies, you can mm -hmm. actually literally do that and pull, pull genes out and stick them in uh, um, on a molecular biological we, level. The, 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 there are techniques to do that. Um, some of those don't always end up making it faster. Okay. They're amazing tools for understanding gene function, mm -hmm. and, and sometimes they, those tools are what you need to do. Um, and, uh, but but some t you, you have to... Uh, each situation calls for a different form sure. of technology, and you have to think about what type of technology is most appropriate for that situation. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. So, um, yeah, uh, so th this is what, what you're, you're really being able to, to look and do sort of what has been done, but to do it on a bigger scale, to do it with multiple kinds of plants, to do it more quickly, more robustly, to get more of those plants out quickly uh, and begin to put them into different environments and spread them around if you want, right? Right, and so, so one of the major things we face are, are these extreme climate events. Mm -hmm. And so if you look at the, the, the slide number two here, what we're looking at here is a, a map of all the environments that, that say uh, sunflower, that sunflowers live in in uh, across North America. We know they're from North America. And what we can do is say, this particular sunflower species lives in this crazy environment. It can be mm -hmm. a salt marsh. It can be a desert, literally growing out of a sand dune. Mm -hmm. And then we can ask the quest. What, what, what we can say is, I'm in this crazy environment. Well, let's cross this wild relative to sunflower to make sure that sunflower now is going to be tolerant of being underwater for right. two weeks. Right. And, and, you know, plants are weird. Species boundaries don't matter so much to them, <laughs> you right. know. Um, and so you can have um, a completely different sunflower species cross with the sunflowers, uh, see, uh, the sunflowers that we grow for seeds that you need at a baseball game. Mm -hmm. And sunflowers are perfectly happen, happy to have that happen. It happens in nature, and we can use that process that happens in nature to our benefit as humans. Excellent. Uh, we're going to have to go to a little break here, but uh, this, is, this is great stuff. Uh, when we come back, maybe we'll get, dig into some of the more specific projects that your lab is working on. Um, Mikey Camper here uh, in the uh, Tropical Plants and Soil Sciences Department at UH Manoa is my guest today here on Likeable Science, and we'll be back in one minute. Hello, I'm Dave Stevens, host of the Cyber Underground. This is where we discuss everything that relates to computers that's just going to scare you out of your mind. So come join us every week here on thinktechhawaii.com, 1 p.m. on Friday afternoons, and then you can go see all our episodes on YouTube. Just look up the Cyber Underground on YouTube. All our shows will show up, and please follow us. We're always giving you current, relevant information to protect you, keeping you safe. Aloha. Aloha. I'm Wendy Lowe, and I'm coming to you every other Tuesday at 2 o'clock, live from Think Tech Hawaii. And on our show, we talk about taking your health back. And what does that mean? It means mind, body, and soul. Anything you can do that makes your body healthier and happier is what we're going to be talking about. Whether it's spiritual health, mental health, fascia health, beautiful smile health, whatever it means, let's take healthy back. Aloha. And welcome back to Likeable Science here on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Ethan Allen. Dr. Mikey Cantor is here in the studio with me. We're talking about plants and genomes and domesticating plants and building better plants, basically. Exactly. And he's been explaining sort of the, the general terms on how, how we do this in modern techniques that, that mm -hmm. are being used now to, to get a lot of better plants. Mm -hmm. But his, his lab, and it's a 
fairly big lab. You mm -hmm. seem to have a lot of people working there, a lot of different projects are doing some very specific things that really relate here to some of it to yeah. directly to Hawaii, right? Yeah. Um, so so we, have, we have two projects that are a lot of fun. Uh, the first is uh, working with chili pepper. Okay. Um, so if, if you can show uh, our slide here. So peppers are unbelievably diverse. So we, what you're seeing here is all these different shapes and colors. Sizes. Um, and sizes. And, and, and it turns out there's actually a huge variation, too, and how nutritious they are. Huh. We're, we're all familiar with the, um, the difference in the heat right. of, our, of, of our peppers, from our sweet peppers to our super hot peppers huh. that, um, well, even though I like pepper and I, I like <laughs> some heat, some of those are, they just kind of sure. hurt. Sure. Um, and some of them, you know, they use as, uh, to make the, your pepper sprays, even pepper sprays for elephants. <laughs> and the, aren't I correct in thinking a lot of that, that heat that we perceive is actually a, uh, it's a defense. For it is. Right? It's, it's, a, it's, a, it it's a defense. It, no. It's a defense mechanism. Main, uh, and one of the big defenses it's against were mammals. Right. Uh, birds actually, who spread a lot of the seeds of peppers, they can't. They have no receptors for the the heat, uh, right. the capsaicin, which is what gives all the heat. Right. Um, but one of the things we found is that we, there's a huge amount of uh, nutritional, tons of vitamin A, tons of vitamin C, and even a lot of folate. Right. But depending on what type of pepper you get. You can have 10 times the amount of uh, nutritive value in one variety of pepper huh. relative to another type huh. of pepper. Wow. And so um, one of the things that we've been really thinking about and trying to figure out is, okay, how can we breed only amongst those uh, peppers that have really high nutrition so that when, if we release a new type of pepper for you to grow, we only make crosses between those types that have high nutritional value. Right, so we, we mm -hmm. can eat peppers that are really better for us, Exactly, right? and also can we eat peppers that are um, pleasant to eat <laughs> across a, a wide range of different heats, um, uh, a, a, a wide range of different heats, and also a wide variety of preparations, mm -hmm. you know, and also where you wouldn't have to eat so much pepper that you'd get sick of it in order to get that nutritional right. benefit, right? right? You, know, I'm, you know, you don't want to eat five peppers at a sitting, but right. if you can eat half a pepper, you know, right. that would be great. That's, that's something that'd be really nice. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that, that's, that's, that's great. And at the same time, of course, you'd be looking at other characteristics that right. will, will grow well here in Hawaii. Exactly. Well, it, exactly. And one of the big things that we worry about um, are, uh, of course, pests and diseases, mm -hmm. but also building on the work of uh, the, the, those sunflower maps that you saw. We've done similar mapping in, 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 in pepper mm -hmm. and are looking uh, at across the gradient of where peppers grow. They're, they're native to Mexico. The tropics are same latitude as, mm -hmm. as Hawaii. And what we're looking at is, okay, can we find those that are particularly re resistant to drought? Uh -huh. Right. And then, and then, are those ones that are resistant to drought? Do they have those same nutritional characteristics that that we that we want, and also some of the same taste characteristics in terms of do we have the right heat profile? Do we have the right sugar profile so that you know you don't get, end up with something that can withstand drought, but you know tastes like cardboard? Right. <laughs> right. And you know, uh, I know they grow peppers in a lot mm -hmm. of the U.S. affiliated Pacific Islands, mm -hmm. and so again, you might want to look at uh, salt tolerance for your pepper. You know, yep. as another it, characteristic. Exa right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And w one of the things that's been pretty interesting, we've 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 uh, some of the uh, Hawaiian peppers that have been here, and some of the peppers that have been sourced from the Pacific Islands. Um, we we like them hotter here than a lot of uh, people do uh, uh, on the on the mainland. So it's very it's very. Um, it's interesting to see how you have these regional preferences and what and what are characteristics that are that that people want, which is why we do breeding and why we do it at a local scale, as sure. opposed to having one type of pepper that we're right. going to grow across the world. Sure, no, this this shows the relationship of science and culture, right? right different, exactly. different cultures like different kinds of exactly flavors, different hotness. In right, the and, and and again, because everyone has this, uh, all, every culture has this intimate knowledge of plants, they do these selections. Um, intentionally and unintentionally right. by, by just what, what seeds do you choose to uh, save, which, which uh, plants become the ones that you want to keep growing right. year after right. year and even just survive in the culture. And, this is, and because uh, we've seen it happen so many times throughout uh, history in so many different cultures, we, everyone feels very comfortable with, with this idea yeah. of you know, eating and growing food. Sure, sure. 
You also, you, you've got a, another project you, you mentioned with sweet potatoes, right? Yeah, so this is, this is a really cool project um, where we're looking at uh, the, we're doing two different things with this project. One, we're looking at um, the Hawaiian sweet potato, the, the, all the sweet potato that have Hawaiian names, and we're asking the question, how different are they from um, sweet potato that, are, uh, that, that don't have Hawaiian names? Because a, as a canoe plant, we're, um, the, the hypothesis is that the germplasm that has retained Hawaiian names uh, is unique and different because it was it, it should be of the lineage uh, of the, those sweet potatoes that were initially brought here right. and it turns out based on the genetic data that we have from screening uh, again these genetic markers across the the, the entire genome it looks like, like that's true the whole the Hawaiian the plants that have retained Hawaiian names um, seem to be a genetically distinct pool relative right. compared when you compare them to uh, samples that are uh, found in herbaria and samples that um, are found in uh, the, the, the National Plant Germplasm Collection. So sorry about the two specialized terms. An herbaria is a museum for plant specimens and where you can go and we can, you can sample that plant tissue and get DNA off of it. You can also um, uh, measure all the characteristics of the preserved right. specimen and the, the NPGS are uh, seed banks mm -hmm. where you store um, either seeds or cuttings of plants uh, so that we have a record of uh, the, the living plant libraries. Right. And, and sweet potatoes are pretty tricky. I guess there's been a lot of debate over where the origin was, whether it was South American or Pacific Island, and they've gone back and forth. On right. So, so sweet potato is one of these really interesting plants. The, the, the wild species that is sweet potato is now found in South America. Mm -hmm. um, but the question of when did it um, leave South America, <laughs> how long ago, was it human? Was it human mediated transfer? Was it transfer um, that was uh, by the, the by the plant itself through tubers, you know, floating across the ocean, um, or was it brought over by uh, another type of animal? That's still very much alive in the de uh, a, a, a live debate. There was a um, a great paper that came out last year where they um, sequenced an herbarium specimen that had been collected by. Uh, uh, Captain Cook's expedition to Hawaii, and so they were weighing in on the debate. And um, the, the, it's it, I, I recommend you guys read the paper. It was <laughs> it, it, it led to a lot of um, discussion in the scientific literature without a clear conclusion, which is part of the fun about it. We don't know the answers. We're still it's still why, uh, up in the air and up for debate. And, and I heard something recent that sweet potatoes themselves are really. A cross between two different, completely, really different plants. They right? are, they're they are. a genetically modified organism well, they're, from they're, nature. Right, so, so the sweet potato is a really, really crazy plant. Uh, first of all, it's, uh, it, what happened is you had two different species uh, cross, and then you had a genome duplication so that meiosis um, and, and sexual reproduction could work. So it's actually what we call a hexaploid, hmm. and it's actually what we call an auto-allohexaploid, which means... Um, it has two genomes from one parental plant and one genome from uh, a, a third parental plant so that it has three genomes <laughs> in wow, it. Okay. Um, and it's, it's, it's quite complicated. And then the other thing that, that they found in sweet potato is uh, sweet potato takes on genes from bacteria in the environment. Oh, yeah. So, so in, in these, these, bac the, these bacteria that infected with plant disease, oftentimes the plants survive. But the bacteria is inserted different parts of its DNA in, mm -hmm. um, so it becomes a, natu uh, a naturally occurring transgenic plant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. This is <laughs> it's, it's a very cool plant. Right. Excellent. Excellent. Very exciting. Yeah. So, and sweet potatoes are a very important food crop. Yeah, and, and so, you and so know all oh, stuff yeah, about it. Yeah, exactly. And and one of the things that's really cool because we found these genetically distinct um, uh, plants that. Uh, form the, the different lineages, we can now start asking questions, what are the differences? What are the differences in nutritional value? Um, what did, w w what did uh, Hawaiians select for in the past? Was there, um, what were, what were um, we know historically from, the, from uh, the newspapers, certain things that different cultivars were, were used for. Right. And now that we can um, see that, well, these are likely the ones that were being talked about in the Hawaiian mm -hmm. language newspapers uh, from the 19th century. Well, maybe these same practices that were used 
we can use for them uh, again, and maybe maybe uh, our farmers can get a price premium for them. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> because, uh, for instance, the ones you would think sweet potatoes here in Hawaii would have genes for sort of a long, stable storage, right? Because they right. had to come on long ocean voyages and not, not right. start going bad, not start trying to, f to grow. Right, you, you de and you would, you would also think that they would... Um, uh, what, what you'd also think is because... Um, you know, Hawaiians were great plant breeders. You, I would have thought once they got here, they would have selected for a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. And you see these different uses um, again in in the in the literature. You know, some were used for um, uh, for for food for very good tasting because they were very very sweet. Others were used as you know, kind of uh, well, we'll say this is the one that that yields well, is very stably, you can store forever, but maybe it doesn't taste great. You have other ones that were used uh, to make to, to make beverages out mm -hmm. of. Yeah. So I mean, you have all these different uses. Yeah. Some were medicinal types, right. right? And so, so the question is now, okay, what, can we dive in and figure out what's what what are these uses? What are the, what's the genetic basis for yeah, these uses? Right, right. Because it's quite likely that, 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 that uh, in this unique germplasm, we probably have some unique diversity. Yeah, no, this, this is great stuff. Yeah. And you begin to see the, the real richness in what you're mining here. And this, this is wonderful that you're doing this, and wonderful that you're yeah. bringing up a, a cadres yeah. of students to, oh, to, yeah. to learn this stuff, to, to love it as you obviously do. Oh, yeah, it's, it's a lot. I should, I should uh, you know, mention the, two, the, 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 the students working on this. Um, uh, Elizabeth, Aurora, and Todd are really the ones leading the sweet potato push, and they're, they're you know, they're the ones doing all of the hard work. I just get to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that life? <laughs> exactly, right? <laughs> well, this is, this is all excellent stuff. Uh, this is very exciting to learn about your work. Uh, I'm so, so glad you were able to come on the show, particularly yeah. at such short notice. Yeah. Thank yeah, you very much for that. Come. And um, I hope maybe we'll get you back and you can talk about more of your stuff. Mm -hmm. Bring on some I'd love to. We can, we can oh, yeah, them I'd on. love to. So excellent. Uh, so Mikey Cantor and uh, talking about genomics and plants. And thank you, sir. That's, it's been a real pleasure. Yeah, thank you so much. And I hope you'll come back and, and join us again next week for more episodes of Likeable Science. You know, think Tech Hawaii.